Hey guys, it's Miss Johns, and today what I'm going to be doing is starting a read aloud with you guys. I thought that this would be a fun thing to do maybe on Fridays, um, is to start a book and we can maybe read a chapter or two at the end of the week and you guys can just relax. I may ask a few questions at the end of the story, but for the most part, this book is just for you guys to have fun with. Um, the book that I'm going to introduce to you guys is actually my favorite book. Um, my second grade teacher read it to me when I was in second grade. And I remember just right after lunch every day, she would let us put our heads on our desk and she would read a chapter or two out of this book. And it stuck with me so much because she would have so much emotion when she was reading it and she would act out the characters a little bit. And I was just like, wow, this makes the story really come to life. So my favorite book that I'm going to be sharing with you guys is called Where the Red Fern Grows. It's a classic. And I'll read you guys what's on the back of it so you got you kind of have an idea of what we're going to be reading. It says, A boy, his two dogs, and one big adventure. Billy has long dreamt of owning not one, but two dogs. So when he's finally able to save up enough money for two pups to call his own, he's ecstatic. Soon, Billy and his hounds become the finest hunting team in the valley, but tragedy awaits these determined hunters, now friends, and in time, Billy learns that hope can grow out of despair. Where the Red Fern Grows is a beloved classic that captures the powerful bond between a man and a man's best friend. It will stand the test of time as long as there are boys and girls who love their dogs and dogs who love them. So if you have a dog or you love dogs, you probably will really enjoy this book. For today, I'll probably just read chapter one in the book because it is an older book. You're going to see and, well, you're going to hear a lot of words that you might not know. And I know that Miss Salas and Miss Torres at the beginning of the week um, had shared with you guys context clues and um, literal words, I believe, a lesson on that. So I want you guys to really pay attention to the sentences if there are words that you don't understand or you don't know and try to determine what they mean and maybe at the end of the video we can go over them if we have time okay all right so i'm going to read chapter one of where the red fern grows there we go there's a cute little picture his dedication page says to my wonderful wife without whose help this book would not have been written Chapter one. When I left my office that beautiful spring day, I had no idea what was in store for me. To begin with, everything was too perfect for anything unusual to happen. It was one of those days when a man feels good, feels like speaking to his neighbor, is glad to live in a country like ours, and proud of his government. You know what I mean? One of those rare days when everything is right and nothing is wrong. I was walking along whistling when I heard the dog fight. At first, I paid no attention to it. After all, it wasn't anything to get excited about, just another dog fight in a residential section. As the sound of the fight grew nearer, I could tell there were quite a few dogs mixed up in it. They boiled out of an alley, turned, and headed straight toward me. Not wanting to get bitten or run over, I moved over to the edge of the sidewalk. I could see that all the dogs were fighting one. About 25 feet from me, they caught him, and down he went. I felt sorry for the unfortunate one. I knew if something wasn't done quickly, the sanitation department would have to pick up a dead dog. I was trying to make up my mind to help when I got a surprise. Up out of that snarling, growling, slashing mass reared an old red bone hound. For a second, I saw him. I caught my breath. I couldn't believe what I had seen. Twisting and slashing, he fought his way back through the pack and backed up under the under the low branches of a hedge. Growling and snarling, they formed a half moon circle around him. A big bird dog, bolder than the others, darted in. The hedge shook as he tangled with a hound. He came out so fast he fell over backwards. I saw that his right ear was split wide open. It was too much for him and he took off down the street, squalling like a scalded cat. A big, ugly cur tried his luck. He didn't get off so easy. He came out with his left shoulder laid open to the bone. He sat down on his rear and let the world know that he had been hurt. 
By this time, my fighting blood was boiling. It's hard for a man to stand and watch an old hound fight against such odds, especially if that man has memories in his heart like I had in mine. I had seen the time when an old hound like that had given his life so that I might live. Taking off my coat, I waded in. My yelling and scolding didn't have much effect, but the swinging coat did. The dog scattered and left. Down on my knees, I peered back under the hedge. The hound was still mad. He growled at me and showed his teeth. I knew it wasn't his nature to fight a man. In a soft voice, I started talking to him. Come on, boy, I said. It's all right. I'm your friend. Come on now. The fighting fire slowly left his eyes. He bowed his head and his long red tail started thumping the ground. I kept coaxing. On his stomach, an inch at a time, he came to me and laid his head in my hand. I almost cried at what I saw. His coat was dirty and mud caked. His skin was stretched drum tight over his bony frame. The knotty joints of his hips and shoulders stood out a good three inches from his body. I could tell he was starved. I couldn't figure it out. He didn't belong in town. He was far out of place with the boxers, poodles, bird dogs, and other breeds of town dogs. He belonged in the country. He was a hunting hound. I raised one of his paws. There, I read the story. The pads were worn down slick as the rind on an apple. I knew he had come a long way and no doubt had a long way to go. Around his neck was a crude collar. On closer inspection, I saw it had been made from a piece of check line leather. Two holes had been punched in each end and the ends were laced together with bailing wire. As I turned the collar with my finger, I saw something else. There, scratched deep in the tough leather was the name Buddy. I guessed that the crude scribbly letters had probably been written by a little boy. It's strange indeed how memories can lie dormant in, an, in a man's mind for so many years. Yet those memories can be awakened and brought forth fresh and new just by something you've seen or something you've heard or the sight of an old familiar face. What I saw in the warm gray eyes of the friendly old hound brought back wonderful memories. To show my gratitude, I took hold of his collar and said, come on boy, let's go home and get something to eat. He seemed to understand that he had found a friend. He came willingly. I gave him a bath and rubbed all the soreness from his muscles. He drank quarts of warm milk and ate all the meat I had in the house. I hurried down to the store and bought more. He ate until he was satisfied. He slept all that night and most of the day. Late in the afternoon, he grew restless. I told him I understood, and as soon as it was dark, he could be on his way. I figured he had a much better chance if he left town at night. That evening, a little after sundown, I opened the back gate. He walked out, stopped, and turned around and looked at me. He thanked me by wagging his tail. With tears in my eyes, I said, you're more than welcome, old fellow. In fact, you could have stayed here as long as you wanted to. He whined and licked my hand. I was wondering which way he would go. With one final whimper, he turned and headed east. I couldn't help smiling as I watched him trot down the alley. I noticed the way his hindquarters shifted over to the right, never in line with the front, yet always in perfect rhythm. His long ears flopped up and down, keeping time with the jogging motion of his body. Yes, they were all there, the unmistakable marks of a hunting hound. Where the alley emptied into the street, he stopped and looked back. I waved my hand. As I watched him disappear in the twilight shadows, I whispered these words, goodbye, old fellow, good luck and good hunting. I didn't have to let him go. I could have kept him in my backyard, but to pen up a dog like that is a sin. It would have broken his heart. The will to live would have slowly left his body. I had no idea where he had come from or where he was going. Perhaps it wasn't too far, or maybe it was a long, long way. I tried to make myself believe that his home was in the Ozark Mountains, somewhere in Missouri or Oklahoma. It wasn't impossible even, though it was a long way from the Snake River Valley in Idaho. I figured something drastic must have happened in his life, as it is very unusual for a hound to be traveling all alone. Perhaps he had been stolen, or maybe he had been sold for some much needed money. Whatever it was that had interrupted his life, he was trying to straighten it out. He was going home to the master he loved, and with the help of God, he would make it. To him, it made no difference how long the road or how rough or rocky. His old red feet would keep jogging along on and on, mile after mile. 
there would be no crying or giving up. When his feet grew tired and weary, he would curl up in the weeds and rest. Water from a rain puddle or a mountain stream would quench his thirst and cool his hot, dry throat. Food found along the highway or the offerings from a friendly hand would ease the pangs of hunger. Through the rains, the snows, or the desert heat, he would jog along, never looking back. Some morning he would be found curled up on the front porch. The long journey would be over. He would be home. There would be a lot of tail wagging and a few whimpering cries. His warm, moist tongue would caress the hand of his master. All would be forgiven. Once again, the lights would shine in his dog's world. His heart would be happy. After my friend had disappeared in the darkness, I stood and stared at the empty alley. A strange feeling came over me. At first, I thought I was lonely or sad, but I realized that wasn't it at all. The feeling was a wonderful one. Although the old hound had no way of knowing it, he had stirred memories and what priceless treasures they were. Memories of my boyhood days, an old KC baking powder can and two little red hounds. Memories of a wonderful love, unselfish devotion and death in its saddest form. As I turned to enter my yard, I started to lock the gate and then I thought, no, I'll leave it open. He might come back. I was about halfway to the house when a cool breeze drifted down from the rugged Tetons. It had a bite in it and goose pimples jumped out on my skin. I stopped at the woodshed and picked up several sticks of wood. I didn't turn on any lights on entering the house. The dark, quiet atmosphere was a perfect setting for the mood I was in. I built a fire in the fireplace and pulled up my favorite rocker. As I sat there in the silence, the fire grew larger. It crackled and popped. Firelight shadows began to shimmer and dance around the room. The warm, comfortable heat felt good. I struck a match to light my pipe. As I did, two beautiful cups gleamed from the mantle. I held the match up so I could get a better look. There they were, sitting side by side. One was large with long, upright handles that stood out like wings on a morning dove. The highly polished surface gleamed and glistened with a golden sheen. The other was smaller and made of silver. It was neat and trim and sparkled like a white star in the heavens. I got up and took them down. There was a story in those cups, a story that went back more than half a century. As I caressed the smooth surfaces, my mind drifted back through the years, back to my boyhood days. How wonderful the memories were. Piece by piece, the story unfolded. That's the end of chapter 